Can you hear us? Very good. Um, our, our track chair hasn't arrived as yet, so we're introducing ourselves. <laughs> uh, I suppose we should say welcome to Drupal South, <laughs> since there's no sort of official welcome, it's a little bit weird to be starting with us, but anyway, bear with us. Um, so yeah, thank you all. Laptop's just decided to turn off, good time. Um, thank you all for choosing to start the conference with our talk, uh, partnering with vendors for agile success. My name's Antoine, I'm an engagement manager at Salsa Digital. Uh, and I'm Alicia Hume, I'm a Senior Functional Analyst in the ICT Division at the University of Southern Queensland. Okay, let's see if we can get this going. Alright, so let me quickly run through with you what we're talking about today. Uh, firstly, we'll briefly introduce you to Salsa Digital and USQ. Alicia will talk about the project that USQ had taken on and the, and the problems that they'd faced. Naturally, a big part of why you're here is to understand the benefits and challenges that USQ faced when partnering with a third party digital agency like Salsa. And since we've been through it, we'll share our key learnings from both sides, should, you, um, should any of you want to go down a similar track and engagement down the track. So who are Salsa Digital? Uh, we're an enterprise grade digital agency, we're about 20, a few more than 20 people. Uh, we're based in Melbourne, but we've got a distributed team across a bunch of countries and time zones. Um, as per the slide, we cover all our traditional digital agency sort of work, um, but naturally we're centred around Drupal as our CMS of choice, hence we're here today, and sponsoring. Um, we love our open source, open data, and more recently, open platform, which has enabled us to be the official partner for uh, GovCMS, uh, for the Department of Finance across the road, and uh, we've got significant input into the Victorian government's single digital presence as well. Uh, so for both GovCMS and SDP, we've partnered with Amazee.io, we've got a stand outside. Um, they're based in Austin, Texas, so we rely quite heavily on our online tools uh, to deliver our work. And a little bit of background about USQ, just to give you some context for today. Uh, we have a student base of approximately 26,500 students, and they're spread across three campuses in southeast Queensland. So I work at the home campus, which is based in Toowoomba, but we're also conquering more of the western corridor outside of Brisbane. So we've got campuses at Ipswich, Ipswich sorry, and Springfield. Uh, we're also really well known for our online offerings, and historically we have been known as more of an online institute. So as you can see, when it comes to online, we've got 69% of our students studying this way, so that's well over half of our student population. Another stat to look at that's of interest is that 37% of our cohort fits within that school leaver demographic. That leaves 63% of our students classified as mature age. And just for reference, I think all of us in this room are classified mature age because that cutoff is at 24. So when I joined USQ, the student portal, which is also called Uconnect, was housed on an unsupported, unstable platform. So it was on an end of life Oracle product and we needed to get it off there. So we did that in 2016, uh, we moved over to Drupal uh, on Drupal 7. So from an end user point of view, the portal was really kept as a bit of a light for life. As you can see, it was just a bit of a modern refresh. But what was probably a core thing for us was on the back end, we made a lot of improvements. So while I'm talking to them about them today, they're really quite simple uh, when I say it out loud. So for instance, Google Analytics and all of our links seem simple, we didn't have that data before. So now we could see what our students were actually doing on the portal as opposed to what we thought they were doing. Moving to Drupal also meant that we could update content easily without fear of the system crashing, which was always something at the back of our mind. We used to have to do updates for simple things like announcements on weekend management days or 2 a.m. in the morning. It really just wasn't practical for us. So this portal was made up of hundreds of links spread across multiple tabs. Some of those links were duplicated across tabs, some of them were even duplicated within the tab. And we expected our students to be able to work through this site and find all the information that they needed. But ultimately, we knew we had to improve the online experience that our students were having. So we formed a project team consisting of a few senior functional analysts, such as myself, and a handful of developers. The senior functional analysts on that team went out and met with many of our internal stakeholders, and we also ran a multitude of uh, user testing and surveys with our students to better understand what we needed both uh, from an institutional point of view and also from a student point of view. And believe it or not, they can be very different. So these ideas blended with the latest UX best practices gave us a final design mock-up from an agency. So we thought we had those two things in the bag. We had our requirements, we had our design, ready to move on. 
But what we didn't quite have was the capability and the capacity to meet our looming semester one deadline. So a really key factor in the tertiary education sector to be aware of is that there's certain times with, or throughout the year that students are really active in their student systems. So for example, O week, first couple of weeks of semester, and definitely during that exam period, you don't want to be touching those systems. So we had a really small window of opportunity to be able to roll out any new functionality. So with the pressure of that deadline and what seemed like a mammoth task ahead of us, it became really painfully obvious to the team that we didn't have a clear approach to delivering this work. So throw this in with a skills gap and undeniably an expectation gap between the business and the technical side, and things were starting to reach a bit of a boiling point. May or may not be accurate representation of how I looked during this time, but we knew we needed help. And the immediate project team was the first to acknowledge that we couldn't do this on our own. We had exhausted our options of trying to get an in-house developer to come on the team for a short-term contract. And previously, we'd been a little bit burnt by working with other vendors who hadn't added a lot of on-the-ground value to the work that we were doing. So we were kind of hesitant to go down that path again. We thought we could overcome these challenges by working with vendors that actually came and worked in the same room as our developers. We estimated maybe three months of work to get through this if we got an extra two or three devs from a vendor. The first step we did was uh, using Marketplace, which is on the Drupal site, to be able to narrow down vendors in the Asia Pacific region. We reached out to those to see if they could meet those initial on-site requirements, and then with what was left, we went through a closed official request for offer. So just briefly, this is what we were looking for from our vendors to deliver the project. Not only do we want people to get in there and get dirty with the code and actually do some development work for us, we also needed a vendor that could offer mentoring and best practice direction to an organisation pretty much brand new to Drupal and ready to move on to Drupal 8, and a team that was pretty much brand new to rolling out major ICT projects. So this is where Salsa came in. Okay, so we went through our typically laborious RFQ process, uh, after which USQ advises that we've been successful in our bid and we get to go through the contract specifics and financials. We settled on a 12-week engagement centred around the provision of a technical team, uh, which included a technical architect and tech lead for that advisory stuff that Alicia was talking about, a front-end dev and a back-end dev. Since we have a proven track record of, we of working remotely, uh, we were able to negotiate with USQ to um, blending our delivery between on-site and remote work. And notice the, the lack in the schedule of project management or government resources on the list, meaning that um, the governance side was being handled by USQ. So with all the details squared away, our technical team flies up to Toowoomba to kick off the project, and it's not long before we run into our old friends, expectation and reality. So from our perspective, which is really the one of expectation, we thought we had it all in the bag. We had that mostly completed design of our new student portal. We had our stories written up in uh, our project management software at the time, which was Gemini. We had a technical team adamant they were absolutely across it. So we were ready, weren't we, Antoine? Yeah, well, we thought so too. Um, but during the first week on site, the, the team, or our team in particular, simply wasn't very productive. Uh, they felt that the scope of their work and general deliverables wasn't very clear. So. We live and breathe out of our JIRA tickets at Salsa, and we found that there were some significant gaps in the ticketing platform, meaning we fell a bit short of our expectation of readiness. This is when I get a call from our chief Salsarian, Alfred, uh, who's wandering around, probably next door, um, wondering if I can get to Toowoomba in the next few days. So I swallow a bit of panic, pretend to know where Toowoomba is, and ask what's happening. Uh, he tells me that after spending a few days on site, our technical architect, Kurt, has recommended some changes to the project scope. Um, specifically, he's recommending a change in, in the resources to uh, assist in defining the project and the project boundaries, these are quotes by the way, assist in defining the stories required to complete the project, assist in defining the sprints in order to deliver as quickly as possible, assist in guiding USQ staff to be able to manage the process themselves. And he also generally recommended a move towards a more agile delivery method, so quite a lot of changes from where we thought we would need to be. Now to USQ's credit, uh, the recommendations from Kurt were well received and we were able to pivot the project and adapt uh, the schedule to include myself in an engagement manager capacity. So everyone agrees to a new schedule for the project with an added focus on agile coaching and delivery alongside the technical mentoring. 
So I jump on a plane and catch up on what's been, been happening and get to work. So discovery. Since I basically didn't know anything about the project and our technical team wasn't being particularly effective, we agreed to restart the engagement with a robust discovery process. The primary goal being to align the whole team on the work ahead. So in Scrum, it's important to remember that the team isn't just the people writing code, it's also the Scrum Master, the product owner, and anyone else that's actually going to be delivering work. So I assume the role of Scrum Master with a view to training one of the USQ devs to take this over later. And Alicia and her colleague Clinton assumed the role of co-product owners. So what did we do in our discovery? First thing is to start by building a lightweight functional matrix of all the, of all the product features. This is just the top part of it that you see on the screen. Uh, and it basically shows each row is a functional area and each cell in that row is a different function within that area. The different shading represents essentially the project phase that we wanted to deliver it. We went with near complete because that's what uh, the devs had delivered previously at USQ but it hadn't necessarily been validated by the analyst <laughs> team. Um, and we generally, when we do this sort of representation, we generally stack them left to right just so we know when we're gonna deliver each function. So underneath each cell in the matrix, there are two numbers, uh, which need to be agreed on as a group as well. So for each function, these represent the business benefit in various shades of green and the technical complexity in shades of red. Alicia and Clinton would decide on the business benefit while the technical team would agree to the complexity. Now, both of these are approximate values. It's not like we spent days laboring over what these were and they're all relative to other functions in the matrix as well. So aside from aligning the team on those two very important areas, these two numbers help us to form a basis of prioritization. If you visualize the business benefit and technical complexity in a matrix like this, uh, you can easily identify the low hanging fruit which you can deliver first and get runs on the board. Um, but the ones that would fit in the red area obviously need to be a little bit more wary of. Uh, but to be clear, if you do have some MVP tickets that are highly complex and less in the business benefit, it's not like you can just not do them. Um, just maybe don't group them all together in one sprint so you can keep some momentum. So after we've done our functional matrix, we start to assemble the stories that make up our product backlog. For a distributed team, we need to store our backlog in an online ticketing platform instead of, say, post-its on the wall. So before we mentioned that USQ ticketing system wasn't working very well for the team. Uh, so aside from a tool that could effectively store our tickets, we needed a tool which had a robust workflow so we knew exactly what status a ticket was in, a clear assignment of a ticket so we knew who was working on it at any particular time, and time tracking on tickets to track effectiveness of our estimates. So the time tracking one's not really true to Agile, um, so some people might frown upon that, but since we're a commercial agency, everything is about the hours that we spend, and we need to make sure that our estimates are holding true as we go. So to move quickly, we decided to onboard the team into Salsa's JIRA instance. Uh, we use JIRA for almost every project at Salsa, so we already had an established configuration and workflows that we could use. Uh, you don't, of course, need to use JIRA to run an Agile project, but it lasts you to put a fair bit of effort uh, into, into working on in an Agile environment, so it's a good, good starting point. Um, so a quick check to see who's awake. Is anyone using JIRA at the moment? Lots. Um, does anyone just have a big board on the wall that they move post-its around? Very good. No low-tech people in there. <laughs> it, can be, uh, it can be handy, though, to, to deliberately go low-tech with a board. Um, we do all spend our time on screens a lot, so sometimes it's good to actually physically move bits of paper around and see that visually on the wall. Um, obviously a challenge if you've got a distributed team, though. So for me, the most important part of any ticket or story is to have strong acceptance criteria that the team is clear on. Every story must have acceptance criteria, even if there's only one. So accept, acceptance criteria, or AC, are just what they sound like, a series of criteria that must be met in order for the ticket to be accepted by the product owner. <laughs> so some principles of acceptance criteria, they have to be clear. Uh, they have to make sense to anyone reading them. Um, that means using plain English where possible. They need to be measurable. You need to be able to say with confidence that a particular criterion has passed or failed. And they, need, they should be outcome focused. So focus on the business outcome of the ticket um, or the what and not on the process of getting there or the how. So the AC you write should be kept in focus throughout the whole development workflow. In our workflow, the, development will, the developer will write code based on the AC, the tech lead validates them at the time of code review and then they're independently tested in QA prior to being delivered to the UAT. A very important point here 
And once a story has been estimated and deemed ready for dev, the AC shouldn't change. So generally speaking, if something is missed in preparing the ticket, then it should be added as a separate ticket and dealt with later on. Um, it also needs to be clear that the product owners can't fail tickets if they've met all the acceptance criteria. So make sure this is known um, right at the beginning, uh, otherwise you can see lots of issues coming up and it's a challenge for our product owners to make sure that they've got a comprehensive set of acceptance criteria. And so from our point of view, having a really clear AC was a bit of a godsend because it allowed us to bring on other analysts into the project, both from just um, at our institution or even I think we had someone offshore at Salsa, and we were able to bring them on. They could clearly see what we were trying to build and trying to achieve, and they could clearly identify what was working and what wasn't working. So once it passed through that QA level, we then passed it on to the business owner or the stakeholder of that core end piece of functionality for an internal UAT check. But one thing to note that we found with the final testing of our AC is that we had limitations with the data that we were using. So we could only access test data from our systems to use in the test environment. So it wasn't until we'd rolled the functionality out onto our beta site that we actually got the final validation of what had been developed. So as you can see up here, this is just a snippet of our site, we had created a mechanism for students to be able to get in there and leave feedback. So by allowing our users to play around it with their real data in a real environment, we could find any usability issues and bugs that we could not identify in our project environment. So thanks to the feedback from our students, we were able to clearly articulate any bug issues and they even gave us a few ideas for future enhancements. So working in that beta environment allowed us to continue to iterate and improve the site. So just as an example, a couple of major issues that were identified were incorrect course listings, which is um, an example up here. There was also uh, issues with course timetabling. So kind of some big issues for our students. But these bugs were not found at all in our project environment. So uh, they were of course prioritised for immediate development and through the Agile process we were able to roll that out in our next release cycle. So the AC really forms part of the user stories which are individual tickets. Now the user stories are helpful because they remind the developer and sometimes the functionals to actually be looking at issues from an end user point of view. So our users want to be able to do something because it'll make their lives easier. So how do we help them and how do we make this happen for them? So we had written our user stories, um, and this is in an example of a earlier one. So hold your phones because there's something better coming up. Um, we had tried to cram all the details uh, about a piece of functionality into one story, and it was making it really difficult for our developers to work out what actually needed to be done. What we learned uh, by working with Salsa is that these larger pieces of functionality is actually called an epic. So essentially we can break the details down of the features into a number of smaller stories that can be planned over sprints. So for an example, example sorry, the original story we wrote about displaying a user's course listing uh, on their study desk block was actually broken down into nine individual stories. So this ranged from the display of the block to the content of the API, things like footer links, it was all in different stories. Now this is the one that you probably want to take a photo of instead. A benefit of breaking a story down uh, into this easy to digest format is that it allows developers to focus on particular elements of a bigger picture. They can document any uh, technical direction and solutions and importantly they can put questions back to the analysts if things aren't clear. The way these user stories are set out really calls for communication between developers and functionals. It is beneficial for the project to have this process documented. At the end of the day it helps final business user understand why certain directions were made or decisions were made. By breaking a story into manageable tasks, sorry, I can just there's a lot of content to get through in this 40 minutes. <laughs> By breaking a story into manageable tasks, it increases the momentum and that feeling of empowerment in the team. The developers feel like they're having a win and then they're therefore more productive and working towards that bigger picture. Stories also allow for better collaboration and creativity between developers. A way this is addressed is through estimating the time to complete a task. So that brings us to planning poker. Okay, so uh, before a ticket can be improved by the product owner, it needs to be estimated. Uh, 
Planning poke is a common estimation method for stories as it uh, evens out the stronger personalities in the room um, from dominating the estimation process. We use this approach wherever possible, except in the fact that sometimes it's not. Uh, today I'm just going to cover the process briefly as I'm sure a lot of you are already across it. So has anyone done planning poke in the class? One hand. Okay, new material. <laughs> so, okay, at the start of the session, um, first you need to ensure that everyone is aligned in the method of estimation. Generally, you will be estimating in hours or points, but you need to make sure that everyone's on the same page with what they're actually estimating. Uh, so during your session, you work through the estimates for each story as follows. So a facilitator will introduce each story and allow anyone to raise any questions that they might have. Ideally, the team should have read the story details prior to the session so that, that you don't spend half the time just reading them. So each developer then needs to select a card um, based on their estimate, but they keep it to themselves. Uh, only when every developer has selected a card do, do they all get revealed together. If everyone has played the same card, then you have your estimate and you can move on. Okay, cool. If not, then the facilitator will lead a discussion as to how individuals arrived at their estimate, usually picking on those with the highest or lowest estimates to, for them to justify why they went high or low. Uh, everyone then needs to choose a new card and you repeat the process until you get some agreement. Uh, if you can't get agreement, say within three rounds, you don't need to keep going all day, uh, then typically that story would go back to discovery. You have a go at redefining it and then you can bring it back into a later session. So as Salsa is a distributed team, we often use an online tool um, as shown like planningpoker.com. Uh, but if you have a local team, you can do this with a specific set of cards that look like those guys over there. Sorry, what did you use again? Planningpoker.com. Planningpoker.com. Am I generally the quiet at the back there? Yeah. I can lean, sorry. Yeah, planningpoker.com is actually a free tool that you can use. There's a paid subscription for more features, but you can actually use the free tool just fine. Um, and you combine it with uh, whatever you want to use for audio. <laughs> Okay, so with estima estimations completed, we can close our discovery phase and move into development. Uh, like you can see on this slide, I'm gonna talk about Agile in general for a bit. Uh, I'm gonna talk at a fairly high level, but feel free to ask questions maybe at the end or stop by and say hi later on if you like. Uh, so in one sentence, I define Agile as a framework to regularly deliver iterations of a product. We define a discrete period in time as a sprint and during each sprint, we deliver the most important pieces of work as prioritised by the product owner. At Salsa, we typically operate on a two-week sprint cycle. Uh, so we suggested this to USQ and we decided to go with that in our time frame as well. So each sprint starts with a planning session. Uh, this is again held amongst the entire Scrum team, so with the product owner, Scrum Master and any developers. The primary goal of the planning session is to define the sprint backlog as um, so that's being the set of stories that will be delivered by the end of that sprint. The main goal is to ensure that the team is all aligned on the deliverables of each story and ideally how they'll be implemented as well. Sprint then starts and each day during a sprint a daily stand-up is held for the team to briefly align amongst themselves. So each person needs to give an update on what they've done since the last report, what they plan on doing before the next report and if they've got any blockers or impediments that usually the Scrum Master will facilitate in clearing up. Um, so the whole team goes through that process. The team then works through a two week sprint, delivering tickets as per a ticket workflow, which we've got set up. I'll cover that in a little bit. And to wrap up each sprint, we've got a couple of other ceremonies. We have a review meeting uh, where stakeholders from outside the team are invited to see the changes that have been made, especially in a effectively in a showcase. And this is an opportunity for stakeholders to inject their feedback into the process as well. And the final part is a retrospective where the team has a, has a look at themselves, openly discuss what went well, what could be improved for next time, and then they agree on some actions that they can take into the next sprint. Um, this is, can be a bit of a touchy one, so it should be facilitated by the Scrum Master or the product owner, and, but you need to make sure that everyone has a voice in that case, and you can do different ways to keep it not being too aggressive. <laughs> uh, a list of actions, is, like I say, is agreed and we move on. Uh, this way you continue to improve the sprint and processes as well as delivering increments to the product. So a common misconception about Agile is that you have to deliver code and actually put something to production at the end of each sprint. That's not true. Um, it just needs to be an effective iteration of the product. Uh, so the USQ team periodically releases the product into a beta platform 
but again, not at the end of each sprint, and that allows the students to test and provide feedback. So as you can see up here, we have prioritised our core features, which were determined by that functional matrix that Antoine had up on the screen earlier um, this morning. So we released uh, different uh, features at different times during the build. So while this diagram is really simple, it was actually a really large part of our change management process internally. So we could educate the business about when things would be released and how it would fit with the semester scheduling. And by rolling out just a couple of features at a time, they were able to get comfortable with the idea of change, which is still a bit of a dirty word around USQ. And they could see how real users were getting in there and using the new features. The concept of agile development was also really relevant to our student uh, users, so we could get them comfortable with the new look and feel rather than just throwing a brand new site at them at the beginning of a semester. Okay, so I mentioned briefly before that each ticket goes through a workflow. Uh, this is the JIRA workflow that we use at Salsa. It's as kind of a standard one, we make changes. Um, since it's proven, uh, we implemented it for the same at USQ. So briefly, what you see on the left side of the screen is the whole process that you go through discovery. So writing up the whole ticket, go through that dev review and estimate phase with your planning poker. Then needs to be approved by the product owners before it's officially ready for dev. Um, usually your ready for dev tickets are the only ones that actually go into a sprint though. So when you're in the sprint, the developers and the team work it through the um, status that's on the right there. So they would move it to in progress when they start on it. When they finish, it gets assigned to a tech lead to review and deploy it to stage. Uh, once it's on stage, then it's independently QA'd um, by generally a, a specific functional tester in the team um, before it can ultimately move on to UA2. UAT, sorry. Now, we would, um, is everyone familiar with QA, UAT? Do I need to? Yeah. <laughs> um, we would also, in terms of a sprint, consider that when it's in UAT, it's done for that sprint. Okay, so um, at the end of our engagement, USQ actually moved to their own instance of Jira and we published the workflow onto the Atlassian, Atlassian marketplace so that it could be directly imported into their Jira instance and they could keep, move, keep working in the same manner, less disruption. So yeah, we're still using uh, the workflow today. We're now focusing on building a staff portal uh, and we're doing that with Salsa as well. And it's just really useful because we're able to uh, track the work and keep that transparency between the functionals and, and the developers. Uh, it's not just the immediate team that's using this now. I've been approached by a number of project managers across USQ who want to better understand how they have a more, um, have a more open system of communication between analysts and developers. And so this workflow is being adopted in some form across the university. I'm really a big fan of this because I think it brings the team closer. Uh, we're all working up the same song sheet and from a reporting point of view, it's really important to be able to see what tickets are where and what the status is. And we can also clearly see what tickets are blockers uh, and this is something Antoine will touch on a little bit when discussing burn down reporting. Okay, is anyone familiar with the burn down chart? A few nods, a few tentative. All right, so this is another tool that we brought to the USQ team. I'll just cover it briefly for those that know about it. Um, a typical burn down chart will show two lines, uh, the ideal trajectory and the actual delivery. So there are a few variations on this on how this can be done, so I'll just cover what we did that you see there. Uh, the blue line shows the ideal trajectory. So at the start of the sprint, it, it shows the total estimated points that will be delivered in the sprint. And at the end of the sprint, it should be at zero. So the line drops linearly between those two points over the period of the sprint. And the flat part in the middle is the weekend between the two week sprint. So we usually don't expect people to deliver tickets then. Uh, the orange line is the actual work delivered and uh, like I said, ready for UAT. Um, so usually you would expect this to be as close as possible and sort of cross over the blue line as you would like. And at the end of the sprint period, you can see that it turns green, at which point it starts to go down at the same rate as your ideal trajectory. And that's just to give you an idea of when the sprint, or well, the work that's in the current sprint would finish if you kept going. Um, important to note that the sprint does not keep going. It finishes at the end of that time period anyway. So yes, we have a third line. The red line. Uh, this was our attempt to, uh, to keep developers informed that although they'd done the code and it was in code review, that it hadn't actually been delivered yet. So trying to give a slightly nicer representation of the work that was done to date, but you can still, we were still quite slow and struggling to get there. Um, 
The important thing about the burn down chart is that it provides an honest and transparent representation of the progress to the team. Ideally, it should be updated and delivered to the team daily by the Scrum Master, but it can be quite confronting to the team, and in our case, it was. In an agency environment, the Salsa team is used to moving fast and having high expectations. This isn't always the case with internal dev teams, so it was probably the biggest source of friction in the project. Do you want to elaborate? Sure, and I think that soundtrack we just had there was a bit what our developers would have liked to have done to that burn down chart. So while the transparency of the project is something that the analysts really love, the developers really not so much. Uh, what we had hoped would be a motivating tool was actually really demotivating them. It was having little to no effect on their output. I think our internal culture probably played a large part into why there was some resistance. Um, they were starting to feel micromanaged on having to focus on particular tasks, note their time on tasks, moving things around on the board all the time. And so from the project point of view, we tried to address the behaviour. We didn't try to add any extra work in the sprints, as Antoine will tell you, that's a no-no. Uh, we were encouraging our developers to work with us in keeping things prioritised. We didn't want them to get caught up in any side issues or bugs because we could create new tickets for that and make future sprints. So for USQ, unfortunately, this was one tool that really didn't work in this agile development process. So would we have changed anything? Well, I don't know, because we didn't know what we didn't know. And in the end, we came out in a totally different space to where we started. Obviously, now we've learned a lot of lessons and we would implement that in the future. Um, but you know, at the beginning we didn't know we were going to learn that. So here's the juicy bit. These are the lessons that we learnt by going through the process with Salsa. So Agile was something we always said we were doing in our team meetings. And we probably could have had a drinking game to the number of times it was mentioned and we all would have lost. But what we actually learned was that we weren't Agile. But with Salsa's help we were moving in the right direction. Agile gives us the ability to work on a number of different things at once through a measured and transparent process. And for us, it really did come at a bit of a cost. Uh, there was a fair bit of upskilling and onboarding of the idea internally. But I think we're now at a good place where ultimately Agile provides a framework that aids in changing the team's culture and work ethics. So there's always going to be gaps and we've sort of touched on this a bit today. It's not just technically, but also culturally between different organisations. What is imperative is being able to work to each other's strengths and work through issues. So having retrospectives provided a safe environment for both of our parties to tell each other what was working and then vent a little about what was not working within the team. We could then try and make a conscious effort to resolve these issues in future sprints. We were also really grateful because we had direct access to the director at Salsa, and this meant that we could get our project manager on top of any bigger issues that needed to be resolved above the immediate team level, and we could all move on with the project work and not get caught up in any side issues. So for USQ, probably one of the core learnings, um, both for the team and just internally as a whole, is that remote assistance is not something to be afraid of. We originally thought we needed to have the consultants be physically in the room with our developers. And one of the great learnings that we got from working with Salsa is that we don't actually need this. We now have those right tools in place and it's pretty much like we're all in the same room anyway. So we've touched on a few of these today, but I'll just quickly run through some of them in case any of you want to use them in any of your projects. I know we've already had one call out about project, uh, sorry, about planning poker. So uh, Slack is a team messaging program. That's where we can link all of our um, team together. I'm sure a lot of you probably already use that, but they can just give quick updates on um, tickets and ask any questions throughout the day. Teams is a very similar uh, program. So we've rolled that out internally and we've brought Salsa on board in our second round of engagement with them. Um, I find this really useful because we can upload any documentation directly into the chat um, functionality. And so Salsa can go view any relevant documentation without needing to access any of our internal files and without losing any documents in their emails. JIRA, we've already spoken about a bit today, so we won't go into detail there. Zoom, that's an online uh, video conferencing platform. We use this daily for our stand-ups and poker planning and retrospectives. Ideas boards, this is another free tool. Um, this is great for retrospectives. Uh, you can share the board 
participants can write anonymously on there so they can really get out there <laughs> venting, but we do make them own up to it later. Um, and it also allows them to acknowledge on hints of what the team's done. Um, planning poker was on the one. No, that's a, um, a free tool. You can sync that with JIRA. Antoine's discussed that a bit. Uh, and by piloting a lot of this work, USQ now has a really positive frame of reference for our off-site work. Um, and I think we've demonstrated that now you can do project with that work without people being in the same room as you. And I think, um, Antoine, did you learn much out of this experience working with us? Yep, sure. So um, obviously we're a digital agency, so we try and take things away from every project we, we take on um, so that we can then pass those learnings on to the rest of the team, continue to grow, et cetera, et cetera. Marketing skills, sorry. Um, the main thing I took away from our initial USQ engagement was that not all development teams are the same. In particular, you can't expect the same work for, from individuals in a digital agency as compared to internal teams. It's not to say that anyone does it wrong or better, but it's a completely different environment that makes for different priorities and processes. So you always need to be conscious of people's individual personalities. Agile is a different mindset in itself that people need to get used to. It's about meeting your commitments without distraction. Some team members like to be helpful where they can, including to those outside the sprint team. In Agile, this can be actually very disruptive as it distracts the team from, from the goals that were agreed on at the at part of the sprint planning so they don't get to what they said they would do. Um, and that was probably the main thing for us really in this case. Uh, the next big thing was to ensure that when your team dynamic changes, or specifically when you onboard a big portion of your team, uh, be sure to execute a robust discovery phase this doesn't need to cover everything that we've talked about today, but you do need to make sure that your whole team is aligned on the scope of work um, and their expectations on what they need to do before they get into it. Another is to make sure that everyone sees the value in the acceptance criteria. So, acceptance criteria for the win. Um, when you put your acceptance criteria together, it needs to be agreed that that is what you are delivering to. In our case, we had uh, the, the, build, the system was already partially built, we had designs for the platform as well, and we had acceptance criteria, and all of them were different. <laughs> so everyone needs to agree and understand that the acceptance criteria are what rule, and when the ticket gets validated, that's what you validate against, even if it looks different to the picture. Um, and it's also a hint to make sure that when you write your acceptance criteria, if it does differ from the design, call out the fact that it is different from the design in your AC. Uh, and finally, like any Agile project, continue to iterate not just in, in, in the product delivery, but also in team processes to make sure that everyone is being as effective and possible as possible and you continue to grow. So here's a bit of a preview of what the student portal looks like uh, now. So it was released on time and to mostly positive feedback from our students. So it's now transitioned into a BAU uh, process, which is in a different area of USQ. The project I'm working on now is still working on improving the staff portal after seeing the successful rollout of this one. Uh, and we're partnering with Salsa, as I mentioned, to deliver that. But at the end of the day, we had to adjust our expectations and my role as an analyst is to partly manage expectations, so probably should have expected that. And I think we've shown today that you can partner with vendors and get a smooth process in place to work between very different companies. Uh, the project methodology that we're being mentored, that we have been mentored in, is still being used today. As I mentioned, not only within our team, but also within the organisation. So to me, that shows a great partnership. The reality is, is that we now have a solid basis for Agile project methodology and a good working relationship with an outside vendor. And we're here today, so I think that <laughs> proves that. Uh, and we're continuing to engage with Salsa for training and development. Um, really, I think you can see the trust is built there. So hopefully what we've shared with you today has given you some ideas on managing not only your projects but also managing some vendor relationships. So we're now happy to take any questions after I have a big gulp of water, but if you're feeling a bit shy or you think of anything later, we'll be around uh, at the conference or you can just hit us up on our emails. And so thank you and enjoy the rest of your time here at Drupal South. Anyone feeling brave and have a question? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you very much for the invaluable uh, overview. You're welcome. Quick question um, about uh, the process. So, using Agile and, and uh, interested in the scope of the project. So, I'm working on a large project and, and we started it at like one or one and a half million dollars in the community. So, now we've kind of pared back and we've moved on to the sprint and we're rolling this out to really, really, really get the business done. Um, one of the problems that we find is that the process of structured building is so broad 
go out on a limb and say that some version of Agile is probably always good. Um, when you compare it to a waterfall method where you've got to scope everything up front, deliver everything up front, or like deliver it all at the end of the day, and then if something's wrong, you're basically screwed. <laughs> if you pair it back to a, of a, of a concept of delivering iterations, even if you're not following any true method of Scrum or of Agile in itself, um, if you just deliver in iterations and make sure that you're validating as you go, that will always help. Um, so, and another takeaway I think is not, there's an Agile purist sort of point of view, um, have that whole vision under your head at, as a client. Um, and we try and get the, the clients to really focus on the prioritization in some senses. So you don't, you don't have to be strict, is my point there. <laughs> um, definitely don't be, in fact, use what works for your team. Uh, when it comes to big complex projects and the very detailed product backlogs, you could look to having different teams to do different parts of the project and therefore you have different product owners. The, the challenge really in Scrum is on that product owner, I find, because not only do they have, they're, they're on the hook to define all the stories and the scope and all that, but they also have to prioritize. And every time something gets added, you need to make sure that it fits into the, into the list properly. And if you don't do that regularly, which is an easy, easy trap to fall into, then you start to lose focus on what's important and what's not. Um, so Alicia mentioned that uh, one of the big changes for them was to be finite in your deliverables. So do try and keep detailed tickets as to what you need to do. What, uh, one big takeaway is if that ticket should fail at any point in that life cycle, you only need to validate a small bit. You don't need to go back and rebuild a whole huge thing again and then validate it all. So you just know really more specifically what you need to fix going forward. Um, but so maybe, sorry, if I haven't answered your question, probably more specifically is look at sharing that product ownership like they did at USQ to have two in, in different areas so they can prioritize them. Um, if it is one scrum team though, you do need to have one backlog at the end of the day. Um, so either have completely separate teams or um, yeah, it can be an argument. <laughs> Does that answer your question in some way? Yeah. So uh, I'll cover the software side. So again, we're a digital agency, so everything is about the hours that we spend on a project because uh, as a client, you want to pay for the hours that we're actually using. <laughs> so yeah, so, so it wasn't an issue on our part because our guys were quite used to it. But uh, Yeah, so the outcome for us really, um, we just kept trying to push our team. Uh, it's mainly during the uh, contract we had with Salsa. So at the moment we don't have any internal devs working anymore um, on the project, so that's okay. But um, we, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it sort of came back on the functional analysts. So we were sort of managing, um, our project manager had a large scope of work, so we were doing more of the day-to-day -day management of our devs. And it was really just on us to be saying, well, you'd estimated four hours, what's so going on? Uh, no, no, some were more on board because they were like, well, it's our job, we'll do what we're told. And others just had a bit more resistance to being able, well, to having to do that um, for those very reasons. There, there are some, um, in a more purist agile form, you wouldn't go time estimates and you wouldn't ask people to track time anyway. I know getting time out of developers is always a challenge. <laughs> um, but what you can boil it down to is in your sprint planning session, so sorry, your estimations that you do in planning poker are not supposed to be minute by minute accurate. That's just allows you to schedule your product backlog to give you some forward projection of when things will happen. In the sprint planning session, you can go to a more detailed, like how long is it gonna take to do this ticket? And the main reason for that is to know what's gonna be in scope for your sprint. And you can tell them at that point, it's just so we know what's in scope and what's gonna fit, and then we trash the estimates. And what that affects and how you move forward from that is you don't need to track hour by hour on what they use, but you look at the end of the sprint, did we complete the number of points that we said we would and therefore affect our velocity? And if, it, if, it, if you don't get there, then it's obviously a topic in your retrospective, just go, what went wrong? And if someone says, oh, well, this ticket we spent a lot more time on, then they, they're aware of that. So you don't strictly need to have the time logged to have that conversation. Yeah? How are we going for time? Wrapping up. All right, thanks very much, everyone. Like I say, we'll be around. Um, Celsius has got a booth just out here if you want to talk to me. 
Otherwise, thanks very much for coming this way.